Welcome to the Serapion of Alexandria. In a city of numerous magnificent attractions, the Serapion was considered to be the most beautiful temple of Alexandria. Located southwest of the city on a small hill known as the Acropolis, the sanctuary was constructed during the reign of Ptolemy III upon foundations which had existed since the reign of Ptolemy I Soter. Visitors of the Serapion climbed a hundred steps to reach the courtyard. Libraries were installed in the porticos surrounding the square building, with its roof and columns adorned with gold and gilded bronze. Pharaohs were generous to the temple, as were several Roman emperors after Egypt's conquest. Since the 26th dynasty, Greeks in Egypt had gradually integrated the Egyptian cult of the Apis bull to their own rituals. With the establishment of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the cult of Apis was further integrated into Greek religion. During his rule, Ptolemy I chose to merge Egyptian and Hellenic gods into a syncretic divinity named Serapis. This name was the result of the amalgamation of Osiris. Serapis was also associated to other deities including Asclepius, a Greek god of healing. It is possible that, as with the Serapis Temple of Canopus, the sick would visit this sanctuary, sleeping there overnight in the hopes of being healed within its hallowed halls. Try using your eagle when you want a top-down view.
Welcome to the Moseon of Alexandria. The Moseon was a sector of the city commissioned by Ptolemy I to rival Athens Academy as an institute of intellectual pursuit. Dedicated to the nine inspiring muses, the Moseon became a great center for philosophical and scientific enlightenment. It welcomed scholars from many kingdoms. The Moseon was designed so that its buildings and grounds would accommodate free thinking, debate, and presentation. Meeting spaces and theaters surrounded a main courtyard. Expansive gardens were filled with exotic plants that aided in the study. Herophilus was a physician who lived most of his life in Alexandria. He was able to perform the dissection of human cadavers on a large scale due to the permissiveness of the city in such matters. Among many other discoveries, he learned that the brain was central to the human nervous system. He also extensively mapped the blood system and measured. In order to be free to pursue their research, scholars were fed and housed at the Moseon at the government's expense. This freedom provided Alexandria scholars a meeting space for intellectual pursuits and a haven for spiritual peace. Though nothing remains of the original Moseon, it lives on as the legacy of our modern museums. Welcome to the Islands of Ferris. The Heptastadion was a bridge-like causeway connecting the island of Ferris to mainland Alexandria. Its name is based on the Greek terms of measurement, hepta meaning seven, and stadion, which is a measure of length of roughly 180 meters. Since its construction would separate the Grand Port to the east and the Port of Eunostos to the west, it was designed with channels at each end. These openings allowed passage from one port to the other. Along with creating separate harbors for the commercial and military shipping, the causeway served as a main aqueduct for the island's inhabitants. Its presence also helped protect the island and its ports from rough wind and sea currents. At the end of antiquity, the Heptastadion disappeared under layers of silt and soil, which formed an important sedimentary deposit.
While the Serapion was the most celebrated of the temples in Alexandria, many other temples were built within the city. Most of these structures have been completely erased over time, and there is no way to discern how many existed. However, research of ancient papyri offer tantalizing hints as to... Both papyri and coins reveal evidence of many temples built for the gods. Poseidon, the god of the sea, likely had an edifice in his honor west of this island, as well as on the mainland. This temple next to you is dedicated to Iset Feria, the divine protector of the lighthouse. This location hosted annual celebrations in the month of April, known as the Sacrum Feria, in connection. Considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria was a source of great pride for the inhabitants of the city. Construction began under Ptolemy I's reign and lasted 15 years. Built on the island of Ferris, the stone structure was three tiers set on top of one another in a step formation. The second floor consisted of an octagonal tower and the top floor was essential to safe navigation through the rifts and shallow waters the Ferris was a functioning lighthouse with a beam. For several centuries, the Ferris was one of the highest monuments ever built by man. It measured roughly 110 meters in height, compared to the Pyramid of Giza, which was around 140 meters tall. Gradually, the structure was eroded by earthquakes and then completely destroyed in 1480 CE, when a fort was built over it. Archaeological excavations on the seabed have uncovered many blocks from the ancient building. It's not the heat that gets you. Well, it might, if the miles and miles of endless barren desert without water don't first. My kingdom for a glass of water?
Don't forget, you can still use photo mode at any time. Welcome to the Siege of Alexandria. Among the collection of writings attributed to Julius Caesar are his descriptions of the Siege of Alexandria, the Gallic Wars, and the commentaries on the Civil War. These archives contain... The Siege of Alexandria closely relays the events of the Civil War that led up to the event and describes how Caesar was besieged in the palace of the Ptolemies. Other ancient authors have left equally valuable and sometimes contradictory information. In the events leading up to the siege of Alexandria, Cleopatra VII and her brother were fighting over control of Egypt. Young King Ptolemy XIII's regent, Pothinus, had firm control over the young pharaoh and an outmaneuver. Upon his arrival in Alexandria, Caesar was presented with Pompey's head the sight of a Roman murdered by Egyptians did not sit well with him. Caesar made his displeasure clear, ordering the return of Cleopatra and for the siblings to resolve their differences and resume their co-rule of Egypt as per the will of their father. Neither Pothinus nor Ptolemy XIII wished to accede to this demand. While doing his best to aggravate Caesar, Pothinus secretly plotted against the Roman ruler and sent word for Egyptian general Achilles to bring his 20,000 men to fight on his behalf. While Pothinus plotted against Caesar, Cleopatra made a bold move.
There are various descriptions of the encounter between Caesar and Cleopatra. One report states that she snuck into the palace alone at night. Another account claims she was accompanied by an ally and was brought inside the palace wrapped in a carpet bag. Though exactly what happened at this fateful meeting is up for debate, what is known is that Cleopatra met with Caesar and earned his approval. Pothinus and Ptolemy XIII were most vexed with this turn of events. With Cleopatra finally present, Caesar chose to act as mediator between the siblings in the hopes of a peaceful resolution. It did not take long for things to sour. During a banquet given to celebrate the reconciliation, there was an assassination attempt on Caesar. It was the Roman leader's own barber who thwarted the attack. Once it was revealed that the king's regent, Pothinus, had ordered the attack, Caesar had him executed. He then placed the young king under guard. With Cleopatra finally present, Caesar chose to act as mediator between the siblings in the hopes of a peaceful resolution. It did not take long for things to sour. During a banquet given to celebrate the reconciliation, there was an assassination attempt on Caesar. It was the Roman leader's own barber who thwarted the attack. Once it was revealed that the king's regent, Pothinus, had ordered the attack, Caesar had him executed. He then placed the young king under guard. Caught within the palace with roughly 4,000 troops and with the knowledge that the arrival of enemy forces was imminent, Caesar sent for help from Syria, Rhodes, and Cilicia. He ordered his men to dig a ditch around the palace and build a wall leading to the harbor. This would ensure Caesar's access to the sea. When Egyptian General Achilles arrived in the city with 20,000 men, the battle for Alexandria began. With so few men at his disposal, Caesar could not risk a battle just yet. He sent ambassadors to Achilles in the name of Ptolemy to propose a truce. Knowing that the orders did not come from the young king and angered by the pharaoh's imprisonment, Achilles had the messengers assassinated. With Caesar confined within the palace, Achilles positioned his troops around the city. Skirmishes broke out throughout the streets of Alexandria and went on for several days and nights. Though they were outnumbered, Caesar's men were able to hold the enemy back. This prompted Achilles' next move, capture the Roman fleet stationed in the harbor.
Diamelias, who are a lovely Gnosis, Dynamax and B, who are fairies. Although the palace offered protection, losing the port meant the end of help and supplies. Caesar knew he had to protect the fleet. While he and his troops succeeded in regaining control of the port, he knew it would be impossible to sustain. Caesar ordered the burning of the ships. With passage back to the palace closed off, he headed for the lighthouse of Alexandria. Fighting their way through the Egyptian troops, Caesar and his men eventually reached Ferris Island. There, they took refuge within the lighthouse. With easy access to the open sea, Caesar was able to send messages to his allies requesting reinforcements and more supplies. The, the exact chronology of events during the war in Alexandria remain imprecise. Conflicting accounts raise questions as to when and even if the Great Library of Alexandria was burned down at all. One account states that during the fighting, docks and warehouses were burned, and this was the fire that spread to the library. In another account, when Achilles cut off the harbor, Caesar had to... In either case, the Great Library was not completely destroyed. Experts point out that its location was too far from the harbor, and much later texts refer to the Great Library as being intact. Warehouses near the harbor contained manuscript copies awaiting export, and it is more likely that these documents were destroyed than the Great Library itself. The destruction of the Great Library may have been due to a number of fires over the ages. Its end was probably closer to the 4th century CE, when the Christian Emperor Theodosius I ordered the closure of all pagan temples. While some documents survived after being moved away, it remains unclear just what knowledge may have been lost. <laughs> Where there are accounts of Achilles being in control of the battle against Caesar, it appears that instead Cleopatra's sister, siding with her brother, had him killed and put her ally Ganymedes in his place. Ganymedes proved a value. During the time of Ptolemy I, canals had been dug throughout Alexandria to provide fresh water. Ganymedes had his men take control of these canals. After isolating their own water supply, he had... Panic erupted in Caesar's men. They wouldn't last long without fresh water. Recognizing that the porous limestone could help them, Caesar and his men dug wells to restore their water supply. Days later, the 37th Legion, comprised of Pompey's soldiers, arrived by ship. Unable to come ashore due to the winds, with help from the Allied ships, Caesar's victory enabled him to push the Egyptians back and secure the lighthouse. Gaining control of Ferris Island sent the Alexandrians into the sea and swimming back to the city. However, Caesar's fortification of the island didn't last long. The enemy regrouped and were set to storm the island. Caesar attempted to retreat, but Port Eunostos' harbor was overrun with enemy ships, preventing escape. 
Reportedly, Caesar gathered his papers and leapt overboard in an attempt to swim to an Allied ship farther out. Historian Cassius Dio claimed that Caesar would have drowned. Unhappy with Ganymedes and wanting their king restored, the Alexandrians approached Caesar with a compromise. Caesar agreed to release Ptolemy XIII after entreating him to spare the kingdom and remain loyal to Rome. Once freed, however, the king defied the agreement and continued the war. By this time, a faithful ally of Caesar's, Mithridates, arrived in Egypt, clashing with Ptolemy's troops at Pelusium. Outnumbering the enemy, Mithridates secured the region between Pelusium and Alexandria. Ptolemy, warned of Caesar's ally marching on Alexandria, sent his troops to prevent passage over the river. Mithridates warned Caesar in time, and the two groups confronted the armies of Ptolemy in the delta. In the Battle of the Nile, the Romans gained the upper hand, sending the Egyptians fleeing. In the tumult and panic, King Ptolemy XIII drowned in the Nile. After the siege ended, Cleopatra VII married her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, enabling her to reign over Egypt until 30 BCE. Under her rule, Alexandria settled into its position within the Roman Empire and eventually surpassed Athens as one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar remained in Egypt for a short time. He and Cleopatra would later have a son named Caesarion. Don't forget, you can still use photo mode at any time. Welcome to Education in Alexandria. The education of young Alexandrians did not differ from the one generally dispensed elsewhere in ancient Greece. At the age of seven, the child was taken in charge by a tutor, who then became responsible for instilling an elementary education as well as good moral principles. was generally done outside, in the open air. In the gymnasium, students were... Here, both girls and boys are shown attending a class given by one of the rhetoricians of the era. The team made the choice to show both genders attending class within the context of the game world. Even though it is historically inaccurate, the team felt it was not necessary to prioritize historical sexism over inclusive gameplay.
Welcome to the Greek Pharaohs. Pharaohs were considered divine incarnations of the gods. As an avatar of the gods living on Earth, the pharaoh's role was to preserve fundamental values and universal harmony by removing chaos, easefet, and ensure that justice, mot, prevailed. The pharaoh, by divine ancestry and through multiple offerings, was the bond that unites the world of men to the world of the gods and allows the maintenance of the cosmic order. The Ptolemaic dynasty reigned over Egypt from 305 BCE to 30 BCE. The dynasty was called the Ptolemies of the Lagids. Born in 356 BCE, Alexander the Great went through a hasty education in the affairs of the kingdom before integrating into the Macedonian army, where he quickly rose through the ranks. Ever victorious, Alexander the Great marched on, laying siege to city after city until he reached Egypt, where the Persians were defeated yet again. Viewed as a liberator by the Egyptian people, on his deathbed in 323 BCE, Alexander the Great gifted the satrapy of Egypt to Ptolemy Lagos. Perfectly aware of the value of Egypt, Ptolemy ensured not only the stability of the country's borders, but also its economic and military development. At the same time, he worked with the Egyptian elite to maintain the internal order of the country. By 305 BCE, Ptolemy, well respected both in Egypt and in the Mediterranean, was... Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BCE. His remains were placed first in a solid gold sarcophagus and then within another. The casket was carried in an ornate custom wagon, gilded and set with precious stones, and pulled by 64 mules crowned with gold. Julius Caesar visited Alexander's tomb at the capture of Alexandria, and the Roman Emperor Augustus reportedly placed flowers there. However, though many powerful leaders claim to have visited it, the tomb's location has gone missing from history. Some accounts do state that the golden coffin was replaced by a glass sarcophagus, probably by Ptolemy X. It is also implied that Cleopatra may have plundered... Welcome to the Hippodrome of Alexandria. The main Hippodrome of the city was called the Legaeon, in honor of Lagos, the ancestor of the Ptolemies. Alexandrians were great lovers of horse racing. They were fascinated by the rivalry of these races. The Agon, as it was said at that time. The most important chariot race was the Tethrapon, Using four horses with the quickest harness to the front right, the charioteer would race for 12 laps with sharp turns at either end of the hippodrome. The victors were crowned with garlands of olive and received prize money, but the most sought after reward was to be acclaimed by the works of poets such as Callimachus and Pindar.
Ye hymns that rule the lyre, what god, what hero, I, and what man shall we loudly praise? Verily Zeus is the lord of Pisa, and Heracles established the Olympic festival, while Theron must be proclaimed by reason of his victorious chariot with its four horses, Theron, who is just in his regard for guests.